<laughs> we continue our series in the, the Book of Judges. Last week, we sort of finished up with the last of uh, Gideon uh, with his sons. And uh, this week, we may move on to Jephra and uh, everything about him. But I suppose in many ways, we're not quite finished with um, Gideon because Gideon's illegitimate son, Abinamech, became the anti-judge last week. And uh, the only, and you remember Abimelech murdered the 70 sons of Gideon and uh, the youngest, Jotham, escaped. And as Abimelech was being crowned judge, he pronounced a fabled curse over him, which caused Abimelech's reign of a few years to be very traumatic and not very fruitful. So after Abimelech, there were two other judges, Tola and Jar. They didn't rule, they did rule for a bit of time and relative pace and stability for 45 years. But nothing much is written about them at all. But we do know that uh, that end of that period before Jephra, Jephra becomes judge. In those days, Israel had no king and everybody did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And as soon as uh, Jair died, the whole cycle of sin, oppression, repentance and deliverance and peace and sin goes back into full burst again. Remember, we've been looking at the, the structure of judges is very important because we see this continuing circle of sin that happens. All the judges are, some of them are good, some of them are okay, some are bad, some are worse. We start off with Othel, which is a good judge, and Ethel, not too bad. Deborah was good. Uh, and then we get on to yet another Mark Gideon. Well, sometimes he was good, someone was bad, but as we learned last week, he left a very bad legacy that left the land in torment for many generations. And this week we move on to Jephra, the judge, who's another one who's really appointed by the community, but then God anoints him. So this is what we're looking at this week. And really, he's pretty, pretty, a pretty strange judge too. So we look at, I've titled this week is the strange account of Jephra's reign as judge. So let's hear the story from the scriptures. Judges chapter 11. The leaders of the Gilead clan decided to ask a brave warrior named Jephthah, son of Gilead, to lead the attack against the Ammonites. Even though Jephthah belonged to the Gilead clan, he had earlier been forced to leave the region where they had lived. Jephthah was the son of a prostitute, but his half-brothers were the sons of his father's wife. One day, his half-brothers told him, You don't really belong to our family, so you can't have any of the family property. Then they forced Jephthah to leave home. Jephthah went to the country of Tob, where he was joined by a number of men who would do anything for money. So the leaders of Gilead went to Jephthah and said, Please come back to Gilead. If you lead our army, we will be able to fight off the Ammonites. Didn't you hate me? Jephthah replied. Weren't you the ones who forced me to leave my family? You're coming to me now just because you're in trouble. But we do want you to come back, the leaders said. And if you lead us in battle against the Ammonites, we will make you the ruler of Gilead. All right, Jephthah said. If I go back with you and the Lord lets me defeat the Ammonites, will you really make me your ruler? You have our word, the leaders answered. And the Lord is a witness to what we have said. So Jephthah went back to Mizpah with the leaders of Gilead. The people of Gilead gathered at the place of worship and made Jephthah their ruler. Jephthah also made promises to them. 
After the ceremony, Jephthah sent messengers to say to the king of Ammon, Are you trying to start a war? You have invaded my country, and I want to know why. The king of Ammon replied, Tell Jephthah that the land really belongs to me, all the way from the Arnon River in the south to the Jabbok River in the north and west to the Jordan River. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they stole it. Tell Jephthah to return it to me, and there won't be any war. Jephthah sent the messengers back to the king of Ammon, and they told him that Jephthah had said, Israel hasn't taken any territory from Moab or Ammon. When the Israelites came from Egypt, they traveled in the desert to the Red Sea and then to Kadesh. They sent messengers to the king of Edom and said, Please, let us go through your country. But the king of Edom refused. They also sent messengers to the king of Moab, but he wouldn't let them cross his country either. And so the Israelites stayed at Kadesh. A little later, the Israelites set out into the desert going east of Edom and Moab and camping on the eastern side of the Arnon River Gorge. The Arnon is the eastern border of Moab, and since the Israelites didn't cross it, they didn't even set foot in Moab. The Israelites sent messengers to the Amorite king Sihon of Heshbon. Please, they said, let our people go through your country to get to our own land. Sihon didn't think the Israelites could be trusted, so he called his army together. They set up camp at Jahaz, then they attacked the Israelite camp. But the Lord God helped Israel defeat Sihon and his army. Israel took over all of the Amorite land where Sihon's people had lived, from the Arnon River in the south to the Jabbok River in the north, and from the desert in the east to the Jordan River in the west. The messengers also told the king of Ammon that Jephthah had said, The Lord God of Israel helped his nation get rid of the Amorites and take their land. Now do you think you're going to take over that same territory? If Chemos, your God, takes over a country and gives it to you, don't you have a right to it? And if the Lord takes over a country and gives it to us, the land is ours. Are you better than Balak, the son of Zippor? He was the king of Moab, but he didn't quarrel with Israel or start a war with us. For 300 years, Israelites have been living in Heshbon and Aurora and in the nearby villages and in the towns along the Arnon River Gorge. If the land really belonged to you Ammonites, you wouldn't have waited until now to try to get it back. I haven't done anything to you, but it's certainly wrong of you to start a war. I pray that the Lord will show whether Israel or Ammon is in the right. But the king of Ammon paid no attention to Jephthah's message. Then the Lord's spirit took control of Jephthah, and Jephthah went through Gilead and Manasseh raising an army. Finally, he arrived at Mizpah in Gilead where he promised the Lord, if you will let me defeat the Ammonites and come home safely, I will sacrifice to you whoever comes out to meet me first. From Mizpah, Jephthah attacked the Ammonites, and the Lord helped him defeat them. Jephthah and his army destroyed the twenty towns between Aror and Mineth, and others as far as Abel Kiramim. After that, the Ammonites could not invade Israel anymore. So Jephthah is appointed a commander of Gilead's army in that story that we heard there. Um, even though he had been expelled from Gilead because they didn't like him, they thought he was a bit of a rogue, uh, they threw him out, they uh, stripped him of this heritage of his tribe. And so he goes off and he forms a band of his own, almost like you could say a bit of a terrorist, I suppose. Um, <laughs> But it's obvious that he's got leadership qualities and um, the leaders are getting desperate. And so they decided to invite him back to become leader. And in fact, they actually appoint him leader in God's name, Yahweh's name. But of course, Yahweh had nothing to do with it. So I know we get the impression from the text that Jephra is a bit of a rogue, an outlaw. He certainly turns out to be a great soldier, a diplomat, um, and had a great negotiation with the king of Ammon, trying to uh, avoid a war, which can only be good, 
but the difficulty was he may have been a good diplomat and a bit of a historian, but he was definitely a bad theologian. Jethro lays down the condition for which he was willing to fight the Amorites. He wanted his status as a clan leader reinstated and uh, the leaders agreed to that um, and they agreed to reinstate him. Um, but the leaders, if they could have got away with it by not reinstating him and giving him his land back and his titles and everything, um, they would have got away, they would have got away with it, but they couldn't. And so that in their desperation, they reinstate him to the head of the clan in Gilead. Of course, the real question about the story as we write it is, is Yahweh really in control of appointing Jephra as military commander and hence the deliverer or not? Unlike past instances where God had played a decisive role in raising up the leaders, he's relegated in this sense to a silent witness because he was getting upset with the people of Israel. If we go back a chapter into Judges 10, we looked at last week, God refused to let himself be used by Israel. And uh, he wouldn't answer their plea for the appointment of a leader. But here we have in this story, a few generations on, that he actually endorses Jephthah's leadership of Israel. So in many ways, God is endorsing him. And we know, that it says, it tells us in verse 29, that the Lord's spirit took control of Jephra and uh, made him the leader that he was. So Jephra became a leader, a good warrior and won um, some victories, but in one way he made a very bad mistake when he compares Yahweh to an Amorite God. Jethro mm -hmm. may have been a warrior, the, the text tells us, and a bit of a historian, but he, he didn't know and understand what a relationship to God and a covenant with God really meant in that thing. Because if we look down there, we see that Jephra said, the Lord God of Israel helped his nation to get rid of the Amorites and take their land. Now, do you think you're going to take over that same territory? If Chemosh, your God, takes over a country and gives it to you, don't you have a right to it? And if the Lord takes over a country and gives it to us, the land is ours. Are you better than Balak, the son of Zippor? He was the king of Moab. He didn't quarrel with Israel or start a war with us. For 300 years, Israelites have been living in Heshbon and Arar and the village nearby and in the towns. If the land really belonged to the Amorites, you would have waited all this time to get it back. So I had a point, but it's this bit where he says, if Chemosh, which is an Amorite god, takes over a country and gives it to you, don't you have the right to, to it? So he makes a big mistake there. Theological ignorance and an error leads to devastating results. The error of Jephra making the worship of Yahweh equal to the worship of the Amorite god is an error that can't easily be forgotten. And so we need to recognize that this, though Jephra was not a bad judge, this puts him in a very bad light in the history of Israel. The fact that he starts comparing Yahweh with other idol type gods. So and of course, then he makes an even bigger mistake when he does this. 
Jethro's daughter. We come on to this strange story of Jethro's daughter. When God had uh, ordained him with the spirit and the spirit took control of Jethro, Jethro went through to Gilead and Massa, raising an army. So this is where he became the leader under God's direction. But when he got to Gilead and before he went into battle, he promised the Lord, if you will let me defeat the Amorites and come home safely, I will sacrifice to you whoever comes out to meet me first. This is a very bad mistake. He's made a vow that if God gives him victory, then he will make a sacrifice. Well, we come on about the fact the first person he meets is his daughter. Not good. But the when you make a vow to the Lord, says the writer of Deuteronomy, do not put off doing what you promised. The Lord will hold you to your vow. And it is a sin not to keep it. It is no sin to make a vow to the Lord. But if you make one voluntarily, you should be sure you keep it. So making vows and promises to the Lord is a very serious matter. And it's not just something that comes up in the Old Testament. It comes up in the Gospels too. Jesus in uh, Matthew's Gospel in the New Testament tells us not to to be careful about making vows, exceedingly careful about making vows, because Jesus says vows must be wholeheartedly fulfilled by you if you make them. So to break a vow before God has serious consequences, if, even if they might not be immediate. It wasn't with this. You, you made this vow. And the problem with his daughter arose sometime later. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, the first one to meet him was his daughter. She was playing a tambourine and dancing to celebrate his victory. And she was his only child. Oh, Jephthah cried. Then he tore his clothes in sorrow and said to his daughter, I made a sacred promise to the Lord and I must keep it. Your coming out to meet me has broken my heart. Father, she said, you made a sacred promise to the Lord and he let you defeat the Ammonites. Now you must do what you promised, even if it means I must die. But first, please let me spend two months wandering in the hill country with my friends. We will cry together because I can never get married and have children. <sighs> yes. You may have two months, Jephthah said. She and some other girls left, and for two months they wandered in the hill country, crying because she could never get married and have children. Then she went back to her father. He did what he had promised, and she never got married. That's why every year, Israelite girls walk around for four days weeping for Jephthah's daughter. Lawson Younger says this, <coughs> Jeff, Jephra's vow is both rash and manipulative. In the light of his manipulating character, as noted in other sections, the vow is another attempt to manipulate the circumstances to his own advantage. In a sense, then, it is not, it is not impulsive, but has a specific intent to get Yahweh to perform. If you give the Amorites into my hands, ironically, his shrewd attempt to manipulate Yahweh demonstrates both folly and faithlessness in his character. The Bible does not say actually whether Jephra sacrificed his daughter as a burnt offering or not. We have this incident where she goes out into the desert. He allows her to go into the desert to celebrate a mourn with some friends, the fact that she would never marry. 
she mourned because she would never become a wife and mother. She didn't mourn because she was going to die. This is a possible indication that Jethro gave her to the tabernacle service to work and live for the rest of her life as a servant in the tabernacle system, the priestly system there. That's what some commentators think, that that's what happened. He didn't put a, make her a burnt offering. He just refused to let her get married and go off and start her own family. But if she had to go into service, giving all that up and, and relations with the rest of the family. However, other commentators point out that Jephra did to her as he vowed. But if we read through other things, it's people and commentators are don't agree on it. That's the word I was looking for with his daughter. So whatever the case, God has specifically forbidden offering human sacrifices. Mm. So it's absolutely not God's desire for Jephra to sacrifice his daughter. And that's clearly stated in other books of the Old Testament. Mm. God clearly indicates the idea of human sacrifice has never entered his mind. Mm. So the account we have here shows that Jethro was very foolish in making silly vows and oaths, trying to make, trying to put pressure on God to give him victory in that particular way. And that surely is a warning to us about making vows and promises to God if certain things happen. We must also remember too, that in sense that there is a connection here with the sacrifice of Isaac. Remember Isaac in the, the story of Abraham, when God commands Abraham to take your only son Isaac, whom you love and go to the land of Morah, which is Jerusalem, and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain. And of course, Abraham obeys that. And at the last minute, God uh, stops it and provides a lamb. So there is a connection we have with Jephra's daughter and Isaac here, both being only children to Abraham and Jephra. But of course, we need to remember that we are reminded of the extreme cost of Jephra's vow. And it's in connection to the binding of Isaac that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. The sacrifices of the Old Testament remind us about the cost required to pay for our sin. But the fact that the Levitical sacrifices for sin had to be offered continuously is evidence that animal sacrifices were never meant to pay the price of sin. They pointed beyond themselves to something greater. And we recognize that as Jesus who became the all in one sacrifice of himself to deal with the forgiveness of sin. So Jethro's unnecessary internal wars we go on to cost many lives. We go on to uh, chapter 12 now. Judges chapter 12. The men of the Ephraim tribe got together an army and went across the Jordan River to Zaphon to meet with Jephthah. They said, Why did you go to war with the Ammonites without asking us to help? Just for that, we're going to burn down your house with you inside. But I did ask for your help, Jephthah answered. That was back when the people of Gilead and I were having trouble with the Ammonites, and you wouldn't do a thing to help us. So, when we realized you weren't coming, we risked our lives and attacked the Ammonites, and the Lord let us defeat them. There's no reason for you to come here today to attack me. But the men from Ephraim said, 
You people of Gilead are nothing more than refugees from Ephraim. You even live on land that belongs to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh. So Jephthah called together the army of Gilead. Then they attacked and defeated the army from Ephraim. The army of Gilead also posted guards at all the places where the soldiers from Ephraim could cross the Jordan River to return to their own land. Whenever one of the men from Ephraim would try to cross the river, the guards would say, Are you from Ephraim? No. The man would answer, I'm not from Ephraim. The guards would then tell them to say, Shibboleth, because they knew that people of Ephraim could say, Sibboleth, but not Shibboleth. If the man said Sibboleth, the guards would grab him and kill him right there. Altogether, 42,000 men from Ephraim were killed in the battle and at the Jordan. Jephthah was a leader of Israel for six years before he died and was buried in his hometown Mizpah in Gilead. This passage in uh, Judges 12 talks about Jephthah's unnecessary internal war with Ephraim tribe that cost so many lives. This is an unnecessary war. The Ephraimites question Jethro's authority of being judge over all Israel. There's nothing positive comes out of this battle. It's intertribal fighting at the end of the whole Gideon story passage. These eternal feuds boil over and serve to destroy the unity of Israel. The Ephronite threat is met with self-exoneration from Jephra, and so war starts. This is all about jealousy, really, envy. It's petty. It's unimportant, but it costs thousands of lives. And so it's a reminder here, I think, this little battle, these few verses in this problem thing, that we need to be careful in our own relationships community relationships with within our church community about the unnecessary wars and battles that go on and as uh, some of us are, are aware that is does cost things in church life and the future of the church it's here in scripture, nothing's new under the sun, we might say. So a little passage in scripture about the way that Israel tore itself apart during this judges period that cost many lives and did nothing to build the confidence of the only people in the God's given covenants that had started off their life as a nation together. So we go on to three more minor judges now. Isban, Elon, Abdon. So let's read about those. Let's listen about those. Ibzan, the next leader of Israel, came from Bethlehem. He had 30 daughters and 30 sons, and he let them all marry outside his clan. Ibzan was a leader for seven years before he died and was buried in Bethlehem. Elon from the Zebulun tribe was the next leader of Israel. He was a leader for 10 years before he died and was buried in Ajalon that belonged to the Zebulun tribe. Abdon, the son of Hillel, was the next leader of Israel. He had 40 sons and 30 grandsons, and each one of them had his own donkey. Abdon was a leader for eight years before he died and was buried in his hometown of Pirathon, which is located in the part of the hill country of Ephraim where Amalekites used to live. So we've got these minor judges um, after Jephra's death, these short reigns. These three judges all have uh, similar things. All the judges enjoy the blessings of life, which Jephra never had. We hear they had children and had families and their places of burial were named. They may have judged, 
but they never delivered. They enjoyed distinction because they were rich, but they never did shine as men of faith. We know nothing about them except their wealth. Of Jabez, we know nothing but his battles. They had herds and flocks, but made no sacrifices. Their daughters were married, but the daughter of J Jethro wasn't married, yet sets an example of obedience and faith over every maiden's heart. So the abundant scripture to demonstrate that God, the true living God, does not work according to human dictates. God will never be manipulated by any human being for any one simple reason. If that ever happens just once, he is no longer God. There comes a point at which God does not answer prayers. Prayers that at their roots are manipulative. It may appear as though God answers Jephra's prayer by giving him victory over the Amorites. Je certainly Jephra thought so. But Yahweh gave the victory because as judge of all the earth, he defended his people and brought defeat on the Amorite king. Jephra's prayer veil was utterly unnecessary. As we said, all these other judges had monuments. Jephra had nothing. Yet he was the only one of all the judges that are commended in the book of Hebrews as heroes of faith, which is quite a contrast when we read through his life story, which we've done this morning. Although he only judged for a short time and died, if you like, in the sense of grief and loneliness, he didn't have prosperity or many lengthy years. The other judges never judged for very long either. So how different is Jephra's life from theirs or indeed our own? But the kingdom of God does not move onward in tragedies alone, but in meekness and servitude. So the book of Judges, uh, we're coming up to Samson is the next judge. Samson, the most famous or the most infamous judge of all. 